Anyway, we'll hack it like this. We'll look at the basic syntax first. Then we'll look at infinite and while loops, then ranging, and a bit about breaking and continuing, and we'll finish with a recap. Well, let's do this. Yes. This one's saying for i is less than 10, but you can use any valid Boolean expression, and it'll basically loop while i is less than 10. Oh, and it's idiomatic across just about all programming languages to use a lowercase i as your increment or your index value. Look, we'll see it soon. Anyway, finally, there's for range, and this is the bizzo, right? It takes a list of some sort, maybe a slice or a map, and we'll cover these next, I think. But it takes the list, and it iterates or it ranges over it from the top to the bottom, looping through the whole list, yeah? And then when it reaches the end, the loop exit and code picks up after the closing curly. So, in the example we're looking at, the list is called course list, and for every iteration of the loop, it works its way down the list and assigns the current value to the i variable. Okay, one last thing about syntax before we see it in action. Just like with if and switch in the previous module, we can give simple pre and post statements on the opening line. So, if we wind the example back to the Boolean expression, basically a while loop in a lot of languages, well, we can do this. So, it's three statements divided by semicolons. This is a simple pre-statement, initializing i is zero. Next is the Boolean expression saying loop while i is less than 10. And then this final bit is the post statement, and it's applying the increment operator, basically incrementing the value of i by one each time the loop completes. Now, it's important that this is a post statement, yeah? So it runs after each iteration of the loop. So we initialize i with zero in the pre-statement. The expression evaluates to true because, well, we've just set it to zero. The loop then runs, and then the post statement increments it from zero to one, and we go again, rinse and repeat, 10 times until i actually is 10. Then the loop exits, i gets garbage collected, and execution picks up after the final curly. Woo, well, we know that torque is extremely cheap, so let's see this stuff in action. Right then, we're in a new code file here called <laughs> selfdestruct.go, and you'll see why in a second, but it's in the loops folder of the GitHub repo if you're following along. Now then, we're gonna write a super quick countdown timer, counting from 10 down to zero. And because I'm, I don't know, a little bit of a sci-fi geek, I'm imagining we're on a space time ship that is under attack from a hostile alien force intent on stealing some important technology, of course. Well. We're also outgunned and we're about to lose the tech. So, as the captain of the ship, I've launched the rest of the crew in escape pods and heroically stayed behind to initiate the ship's self-destruct on a 10 second timer. So, we're about to write that self-destruct timer code. Anybody still here or have you all left? Okay, look, um, we're inside the main function and I guess we could initialize the timer variable right here. But we're not going to. It's more idiomatic to declare it as part of the loop. And like I said, we'll start at 10. But we want it to count down to zero and then stop. So each time the loop runs, we want to decrement the value by one. OK, well, like all good self-destruct timers, we need something telling us how long is left. And we're going to need something to insert approximately a one second delay each time we iterate. Okay, I reckon that might do us. Oh, I forgot to mention. Obviously, we're leveraging a couple of functions from the time package we're importing up here. Anyway, when the timer reaches zero, we want something a little bit spectacular. So let's whack in a quick if statement. So if timer equals zero, then run this. Boom. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, not quite so spectacular. Whatever though, let's give it a save and a run. Literally run before the ship blows up. Okay, so what shall I do in the last few seconds of my life? Oh, yeah, obviously, Sunderland are the greatest football team in the world. Ciao, ciao. Okay, it worked. Well, kind of. I've got this sloppy zero hanging around. Now, 
to fix that, I guess we could loop while greater than or equal to 1. But actually, no, it would never trigger the if statement, would it? So tell you what, we'll slap in a break. Now, we're going to look at break properly later. Anyhow, after we execute the boom, and I suppose it wouldn't make much of a sound in the near vacuum of space, but what the heck. Then as soon as we hit the break, we exit the loop and we run any potential code immediately following the closing curly. Meaning we shouldn't see the sloppy zero anymore. Well, we'll check if that works. Let me speed it up this time. It's a bit like Groundhog Day or boss level if you've seen that. All right, way better this time. But really quick before we move on, just to be clear, this pre-statement here gets executed before the first evaluation of the expression. Then the post statement, that gets executed post or after each iteration of the loop. But importantly, that is before we reevaluate the loop condition. Okay, well, next up, we'll look at four range loops. Okay, four range loops. And to demo this, we're back from outer space. I guess I went back time or something so that we're before the self destruct. Either way, we're back to our good old plural site courses. Now then, this here is a list of courses in progress. And to make it easier to read, I've split it over multiple lines. Now, technically, it's a slice, basically an unordered list of numbered items. Well, actually, under the hood, it's a reference to an array and the likes, but we'll cover all of that in the next module. For now, all we need to know is it's a list. So we've got a slice of four strings, four courses, yeah? And to ease you in gently, let's just jump straight and see four range in action. So the range command is going to take the list range over it, so step through it, one value at a time until it reaches the end. But it steps through one element of the list per iteration of the loop. So the first time the loop runs, it'll get one course. The next time, it'll get another, and so on. Now then, with slices, for range returns two values each time it loops, the index value and the data value. We've got four items in our list, so that'll be indexes 0 through 3. The first time through the loop, it's probably going to get 0 and Docker and Kubernetes the big picture. The second time, 1 and Docker networking, then 2 and getting started with Kubernetes, and finally 3 and Kubernetes deep dive. Now, for our for loop, we're not bothered about the index value, so we'll ignore that by passing it to the underscore, the blank identifier. But each data value, yeah, we'll hang on to that with the i variable. Then, obviously, we're printing i to the terminal each time we loop. So, we should end up printing the names of all four courses. Okay, let's save that and give it a go. All right, just as expected. Now then, we can also nest loops, so loops within loops. So to do that, we'll have another slice of strings, this time courses marked as completed. So just to be clear, we've got two lists now, one listing courses in progress, the other listing courses completed. Well, let's add another for range here, importantly, inside the existing loop. Well, this one's going to loop through the completed courses list and see how it's using J to hold the values from it. So, the outer loop is holding values in i, the second inner one in j. Well, let's add an if here, comparing i with j, and then printing this if they match. So, looping over courses in progress and also courses completed, with an if block to spot if a course appears in both the in progress list and the completed list. And. <laughs> If you're new to this and it's feeling a bit much, let's just step through the flow nice and slowly. We have got the outer loop stepping through the list of courses in progress. But inside of that, we've got a second loop stepping through the list of courses completed. Now then, on the first iteration of the outer loop, it's going to stick Docker and Kubernetes, the big picture, into the I variable. In fact, let's put that up here. Okay, anyway, next up, 
we hit this line here. So we start iterating through the inner loop and we stick the first value from the completed list into the J variable. And look, it's gonna be Docker and containers the big picture as well. That means when we do this if comparison here, we'll get a match and we'll print this line. Okay, well, we'll hit the closing curly of the if statement here and we'll go back to the top of this loop again, the inner one, and we'll run through that again. This time we'll put this in J. Does I match J this time? Negativo, and we hit the end of the completed list. So we leave the inner loop. We hit the closing curly of the outer loop, but we've not reached the end of the list for the outer loop. So we go again. Well, this time we'll put the Docker networking course into I and go through it all again. So back to our inner loop. A couple of iterations, one for each of the two values, yeah. Each time again, checking for a match. This time we won't get any matches, so we'll come back up here, rinse and repeat. Shall we see if it works? Okay, well, remember to save your changes. Oh, and we don't need this print LN here anymore. Let's give it a go, though. <laughs> and as if by magic, it works. Now, I know it was a bit of a convoluted example, but we've seen how to nest loops within loops, as well as throwing in some if blocks. Well, time for a quick look at break and continue before we recap everything we've learned. Time for a quick look into how break and continue work. In fact, we saw break earlier when the self-destruct timer was flashing a zero that we didn't want. Remember, we put a break in here inside the if block, which in turn is inside the loop. But as soon as program flow hits the break, it literally breaks out of the loop and execution picks up after it's closing curly. And you know what? Yeah, that is break in its most basic form. It breaks out of the current loop. But what about nested loops like we've got here? <sighs> and apologies for the colors. They're just there trying to help highlight the different loops. But we've got three nested loops and apologies if you're colorblind. I hope they are visible and make sense. Well, if we break here in the innermost loop, we'll drop out to this loop here, the blue one. Then we'll hit its terminating curly, go back to the top for further evaluations and potentially more iterations. Magic, but what if we want to break out, I don't know, two levels, maybe to the outermost orange loop? <laughs> no sweat, that's where labels come into play. So we can make a label up here, we'll call this one uh, breakpoint. But honestly, you can call it pretty much whatever you want. Just obviously don't call it one of those, whatever it is, 25 keywords. Anyway, when we make the call to break here, if we give it the label, instead of just breaking out of the current loop, we'll break to here, thanks. And that really is the crux of break. In its most default form, it breaks us out of the current loop. But if we use labels, we can break to pretty much anywhere we want. Though, a bit of a gotcha. Go being go, yeah? It is not a fan of you defining labels and then not using them. So, if you define one, you gotta use it. Well, switching gears slightly to continue. The idea with continue is that whenever go encounters one in a loop, it drops whatever it was doing and it jumps straight back to the top for a new evaluation and potentially more iterations through the loop. Oh, and actually, post statements, they are actually executed as part of the continue. So basically, stop what you're doing, run any post statements, and then reevaluate the expression and maybe go again. Well, we've got a bit of our old self-destruct timer code here. So defining a timer as 10 and then looping while it is greater than or equal to zero and decrementing by one for each iteration of the loop. Well, if we change this if statement to this, okay, we're using some simple math to determine whether or not the value in timer is an even number. If it is, we'll run the continue here, which we just said interrupts normal flow, so it skips the print ln here, and obviously the injection of time as well, 
but it jumps us straight back to the top where we run the post statement here to decrement the timer by one and then we reevaluate the expression. Look, basically, we are skipping the print ln every time it's an even number, meaning when we run it, we should only see odd values. Well, let's go and see if that actually happens. Okay, magic, only odd numbers. And that, folks, is break and continue. Whew. Let's wrap the module with a quick recap. Okay, let's make this quick. Go only has one keyword for loops, four, but it is pretty flexible. It can do infinite loops, traditional while loops, where it loops while a Boolean expression is true, and it also does range loops where it steps through a list. So the for keyword on its own is the equivalent of while true, so an infinite loop. If we use it with an expression like this, it loops while the expression evaluates to true. Like I said, a lot like a while loop in some other languages. But then range loops, which look like this, range or iterate over a list, and the loop exits when the end of the list is reached. Well, as well as that, we saw they can have simple initialization statements that run before the loop starts, as well as post statements that run after each loop. Okay, we also saw we can nest loops within loops within loops within loops. And of course, other code like if statements and the likes can all go inside of loops. But then last but not least, we saw how we can use break on its own to break out of the current loop but if we couple it with a label, we can target pretty much anywhere for break to land. And then the continue keyword lets us drop the current flow of a loop, return to the top where we run any post statements, and maybe run through the loop again. Okay, well, look, a really quick peek into the Kubernetes code base again, and we'll just go for the same deployment controller code that we went with last time. Only this time we'll look for for i. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, look, it's just easier than looking for four on its own. Anyway, this one's a classic example. So we can see it's got a pre-statement initializing i. <laughs> Told you it was idiomatic. Then it's evaluating if i is less than the value stored in workers. And then the post statement here increments it for each run of the loop. Then, of course, there's code here inside the loop to run, which this time is a call to a function, but it's using the go keyword to start it as a go routine. And I know that might be a bit complicated, but if you've been following along, you'll know that the wait package here must be being imported somewhere at the top, and that this function here is part of that wait package, and it's exposed because it starts with a capital letter. Um, actually, in fact, if we click this, yeah, look, this is the package it's declared in, and we can even click this, and there it is. But you know what? That's not the point. The point is, you will see for loops everywhere in Go. Mahoosively useful. Okay, well, we're rattling through stuff. Next on the card, arrays and slices.